afternoon. I see you're all warmed up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed out on the background. So, living in Bermuda back in the year 2000, Rob said to me, Jackie, we should live off grid on a boat. Okay. Having only ever crossed the English Channel on a ferry in a gale, I wasn't convinced. <laughs> but, I mean, he grew up in Savannah. But he described the idyllic setting, the money, and the glorious outdoor lifestyle. I was sold. And we lived on a 30-foot sailboat for five years. But the idyll I promised was challenged somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. sound there's our boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a hurricane. Hurricane Fabian, to be exact. She survived. <laughs> With 160 mile per hour winds and a 12 foot storm surge, damage was widespread across the island. Many lost their boats, and some had boats on their front porch. This was the bay we lived in, and most of these folks had no road, road access for upwards of two weeks. They could only get to each other's houses to help each other through the use of chainsaws. Without a network of friends to help them get food, the situation could have been grim. But the value of community connections, social capital, was proven by Hurricane Fabian. Everyone pitched in, everyone mourned the dead, and everyone stayed. Bermuda proved resilient in the face of natural disaster. And with two solar panels and a wind generator, where most of the island was without electricity for six weeks, we had power. We had our first lesson in personal resiliency. Contrast this with what happened in Katrina. Uh, Ninth Ward was a community with nowhere to go and no way to get there. Government was unprepared, and therefore it was a community forever changed. Many of the survivors left never to return. And so New Orleans was not resilient. But what exactly do we mean by this term? Resilience is the ability to withstand a shock, whether economic or environmental, without experiencing threatening upheaval. But community resilience is not just about natural disaster preparedness. On a personal and societal level, we must decide what we need to be resilient in the face of. Our culture is facing immense challenges, in case you hadn't noticed, mm -hmm. um, that aren't going to get a response from FEMA. For instance, our supply of easy-to-get, cheap, amazingly energy-dense oil is dwindling. According to the Energy Information Agency, peak oil occurred in 2006. Now, here's a quick visual just to explain peak oil for you. to get a hundred, now we get as little as five. And the Alberta tar sands is a prime example of this. This is where we're turning this lovely boreal forest, one of the finest carbon sinks in the world, into this square, thousands of square kilometers of industrial mining site, one of the worst carbon emitters in the world. And we're also experiencing strange climatic events caused by greenhouse gases warming the atmospheric envelope of the Earth. And with thermal lag, we're currently experiencing the warming caused by gases emitted in the 70s and 80s. We have yet to feel the repercussions of 40 more years of even higher emissions. Additionally, our economy is teetering. We're experiencing shocks to the economic system, at least partially due to its complete dependence upon the exponential growth in the use of resources. This has rocked our faith in our pensions, healthcare, mortgages, jobs, for some people, even the provision of basic needs. Now, while this all may sound kind of grim, and you're thinking these two sustainability freaks are going to tell us how we can remedy these problems, mm -hmm. or perhaps you're paralyzed by the immensity of all these crises mm -hmm. that face us. That's common when pink, peak oil sinks in. Maybe you're in the ostrich camp? <laughs> so long as I can get my petrol for $3 a gallon, all is well with my world. But we know that there's growing dissatisfaction with the volatile economy. 
Our uh, ex economy is experiencing energy supply fluctuations as well as other resources, which causes all sorts of fluctuations and problems with the prices that we depend upon. Clearly, business as usual is not going to work no matter how sandy our heads get. Mm. And isn't it better to prepare for it? Because even if we're wrong, which is not often, but sometimes we can be wrong, we will have built sustainable, resilient communities. You can't argue with that, surely. So let's get down to the basics. What are the characteristics that any community, city, even neighborhood needs to be considered resilient? Local control of vital security factors is essential. For instance, food, water, energy, that sort of thing. Community involvement in the decision-making process and so how that happens is also essential. That's not going to happen without a functioning, participatory, inclusive democracy. Focus on flexibility and adaptation to quickly changing times is important. Once you know the inherent strengths of your community and your native resource base, then create a reskilling program customized to your area. And as with any serious endeavor, planning is required. We must first identify the challenges and formulate a plan to deal with them collectively and in a nonpartisan manner. Now, most planners presume the graphs all go upwards. More cars, more houses, more energy, more stuff. And that's the only way they know, to how, know how to plan. Planning with that curve is a bit of a waste of time because we know on a finite planet with a finite resource base and a growing population, many of the curves are much more likely to be downward for some time yet, if not permanently. So what we need is an energy descent plan, one that's realistic, that stewards our resources carefully, and that takes us towards a stable economy, not one based on global consumption. What an opportunity for creative and exciting planning. Very exciting. We got excited and we said to ourselves, what can we do? Now, we're social beings, and we didn't want to head for the hills, saving just ourselves, while the rest of you fall into the dystopian nightmare predicted for the suburbs. <laughs> so we said, well, let's become more self-reliant. But no matter how much food and energy we produce on our property, we knew we would still need inputs from the community. And our path led us to two projects, the Sustainable Living Project and Foothills Transition, for which no one pays us for any of this, by the way. <laughs> So let's look at the Sustainable Living Project first. This is a design Rob did about three years ago when he finished his studies in England of a renovation to our property here in Hickory where we attempt to live a more resilient lifestyle. And you can see the black stripe on the South Shade system, which is the proposed solar canopy. It will be solar thermal and PV, and the rest of that shade structure will be shaded by vegetation in the summer, which drops its leaves in the winter and then the sun, solar gain, will hit the glazing tile and brick, the thermal mass, and heat the house in the winter. And as this sh slide shows, there are other features that weren't in that drawing. Here's me installing our EPA certified high efficiency wood stove under careful supervision. Um, and we, we burn, much like the eco-complex, we burn wood from our neighbor's waste stream. So we don't cut down any trees and we don't cut down our budget. And our insulation and the passive solar modif design modifications that we've installed means we don't need that much heat to begin with. Now, glassing in the veranda provides a, a thermal envelope around the vital southeast corner of the house. Um, it's actually the south corner, southeast, southwest, um, to keep the house warm, to gather heat, and also to grow food in the winter. And rainwater is far better for your garden, has fewer chemicals, and is way less energy intensive than city water. We've installed over 6,000 gallons of rainwater storage. You can see a couple of our six big tanks here. And um, while the deck is going in, that's going to shade and protect the tanks. The vegetation will grow up the front and hopefully keep the tanks cool in the summer. And you can see the water intake system with a first flush roof washer that takes bird poop, pollen, and debris from the roof first to give it a clean, and then the clean water goes into storage. Now, while currently we just use this for doing our laundry and for the garden, we have plans this year to build a Bermuda-style whole house pressure system for domestic water from these tanks. And in Bermuda, rainwater harvesting is mandatory, and that's why they're so resilient with regards to water. Another feature of the rainwater harvesting system was a metal roof. We knew we didn't want to collect water, even for our gardens, much less to drink off an asphalt roof. So we put in a reflective metal roof over an, over an inch of insulation 
over the asphalt tiles, because we also didn't want the asphalt tiles scraped off and have all those hydrocarbons in our garden where we're growing our food. So what happened was, with the combination of the reflectivity and the insulation, it reduced our upstairs temperature by 15 degrees immediately and gave us a clean surface to collect water from. And out in the garden, we try and eat something organic most days. We have a permaculture-style design, which is ongoing, which has some raised beds, but mainly perennials and new fruit and nut trees. We practice lasagna-style mulching to try to disturb the soil as little as possible so we don't destroy its structure. You can see some terracing going on here to prevent rainwater runoff. And we also have compost and leaf mold piles with chickens and worms on the way. So in the first year and a half, we harvested over 20 pounds of strawberries, uh, about 15 pumpkins, butternut squash, tomatoes, melons, beans, cucumbers, peppers, fruit, onions, garlic, herbs, and greens all year round. But more importantly, just look at that lawn. <laughs> it's a barren, energy-sucking, water-polluting, money-draining, time-wasting monoculture. How do you really feel about it, darling? We've replaced it with rich, water-retaining, water-purifying, biodiversity-promoting, food-producing soil. And through the total avoidance of any toxic chemicals in our gardens, biodiversity has spread from eight inches down right up to the top of the trees. In fact, the biodiversity is so comfortable and prolific in our garden, it even inhabits Rob's boxer shorts. <laughs> Don't laugh, this is serious. One evening, at dusk, I was unpegging his boxer shorts from the line. They flapped violently in my face, and out of the leg flew a Carolina wren. <laughs> it was roosting there. I could hear the screams from half a block away. Um, let's see. So we had a lot of produce we had to deal with, so we've had to learn how to, keep, how to can, to freeze, to dry, and to store all the produce. This beautiful turmeric plant, only one plant produced all that root, and that's, it's like a bonanza. We just, we just keep getting more and more food out of our garden. Our sweet potatoes grew to the size of footballs. And I call these ugly tomatoes. Ah, ugly. <laughs> but they're actually beautiful because they're homegrown organic. They're ugly, but they're tasty. Yeah. And with all this wonderful produce, all you need is a solar oven. Here's one of Rob's contraptions built out of recycled materials. And you're right, those are chocolate chip cookies in there, not produce. But at a certain temperature, the wood glue we used off gases, and these were actually toxic cookies. So now we use a seal pressure cooker in that particular oven. Now, careful control of our finances has been important. When we um, lived on the boat, we saved enough money to buy our house with cash, as well as two rental properties here in the area, which is the meager income that we actually live off of, which is so meager that we actually don't have to pay any taxes, which is kind of nice. Um, we have a 25-year-old car, which we use like a pickup truck, as you can see, and we have absolutely no debt. Now, this lends us an astonishing amount of flexibility Recently, I discovered in probating my father's will that according to the credit agencies, I don't exist. So that's a really major accomplishment as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> there are many lifestyle decisions that we've made, some by choice, some by financial necessity. Uh, some significant ones include designated no driving days, no satellite or cable television or landline. We do have internet because we're researching all the time and we can watch some television through the internet so we're not starved of popular culture. And um, we also have only limited health insurance. We're part of a health cooperative and we have uh, a fairly healthy lifestyle. For the most part. Uh, being transient so long, it was a pleasure to discover the community that we'd actually moved into. Here's some of our neighbors here and we started uh, a, a network of trading seeds and transplants and that developed into me building some raised beds for them and then it, that developed into a network of sharing tools and work and knowledge which she capitalized on. We had a big party so 50 odd people came I directed a little Shakespeare backyard neighborhood play and we celebrated the rich connectedness of being part of this great community that is Sir Toby Belt drinking apple juice not beer. <laughs> So we, we know that we've decided that community resilience is the key to future economic stability because it's about local soil, local people and their talents and local conditions. That's where the problems are going to be solved. Central government alone is not going to be able to solve peak oil, climate change and financial instability. But if we relocalize our communities, we can move forward into a more resilient future. So we decided after getting to know our community that the time was right to start Foothills Transition. We've been doing our awareness raising presentations ever since. A transition started in, tra in Totnes, England, 
and it is exactly about relocalizing. It's all about returning control of those vital security factors to local control. Now, many things are already happening here in Hickory, as we've seen here today, and there's a lot more of it out there. Transition seeks to partner with those efforts and to build on this vital work moving forward. We already have one working group up and running, the Energy Working Group, hopefully one of many um, that we can get going. Food, economy, transportation, green building, whatever people have a passion about. And the Energy Group, I think, will start off with this project. It's a solar batch heater. Rob made this one for Transition Bermuda a couple of years back out of recycled materials. We hope to run some workshops on that. Uh, also up and running, the Lenore Family Food Initiative have connected food distribution for the needy with education on growing and a model edible garden. And we've partnered with a film series on, with movies on energy and water issues. Our booth goes out to community events and our newsletter to 200 people. So it's just starting to pick up. Now transition is all about just getting up and doing things and it shows people what a more sustainable lifestyle might feel like. There is huge power in starting actions, just starting something. And it shows that not only can we move towards a less fuel dense future, but that this way of life might actually better meet our needs. So in conclusion, a sustainable living project is not a business, it is our home. But it's also a community demonstration platform. It's about building self-reliance. But it's also about showing people that it need not be primitive nor difficult. In fact, it's creative and inspiring. Marry this with engaging the community in local actions to create the world we really want to leave for future generations. And you have a rich and positive way forward that connects people, cares about the earth, and gives us all hope. Now, who wouldn't want that? Thank Thanks. you.